Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second in our series of Ask the Expert interviews on the on the Thermal Scientific Orbit of Explorers 120 mass spectrometer. My name is Maciej Berminski. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for the Hybrid Instruments. And today we are speaking with Olaf Scheibner, who is the Team Leader Sales Support on the subject of resolution. Hello, Olaf, and thank you for joining us uh, today to talk about this very interesting aspect of the instrument, specifically on the resolution. Hello, everyone. So let's look into specific resolution on the OrbitFab Explorers 120 mass spectrometer. First, let's have a look into history, uh, how this all evolved. So already roughly 100 years ago, a um, researcher from the United Kingdom called Kingdon uh, recognized that ions will spin around a charged wire quite nicely. And if you can put them into a box, uh, they will do this for a while. But the practical aspects of that were not absolutely clear, so that dropped silent for a while until a young researcher came along called Alexander Makarov. Uh, seeing the potential of this principle and developing a device uh, that would make the ions better controllable inside. So he came up with this uh, new shape of the device, which would make the ion spin left to right inside that device. So this is how it looks like. And looking, once the ions are spinning inside here, you can describe them in certain ways. It's a quite complex formula. Um, and I think not too many people in the world understand this formula in total, but luckily Alexander does, and he's part of Thermo Fisher Scientific. So we can leverage on that. And there are certain frequencies important for the movement of the ions. And there's one specifically that has the mass to charge ratio inside. So basically the mass of the ions that we want to know. <clears throat> It's in the square root, so that's an easy one with a constant. This constant we can later on call calibration of, of a device. Uh, so that's an easy one. We just need to get the frequency. So how about the frequency inside? The frequency we are talking about is the frequency spinning along the center axis, along the uh, charged center electrode. If you look into that, the ions are coming along, entering the device, and once they are in the device, they start to spin uh, left to right inside the instrument. And if you look at that from the outside, it seems to be a ring that's spinning left to right or that's moving left to right. Uh, and so we can detect this because there are moving charges and moving charges give an outer image current that we can detect like a radio detector. So that's an easy one, but it doesn't stay that easy because of course we have many ions, not only three as shown here, we have hundreds and thousands of different ions entering the device and spinning there. But they do us a favor, they all spin in their own orbit around the center electrode. So they have different distance from the center electrode. And even if they move against each other, they do this as different distance so they don't collide and we don't have a collision cell here. So we can detect that, uh, but we are left with one problem that we have thousands of ions going left to right. So we have thousands of frequencies overlaid. Luckily, mathematics has found a solution to that problem earlier already. Uh, that with the principle of Fourier transformation, we can change that <clears throat> mix of frequencies that we detect into se uh, separate frequencies. And then we are here, that's the equation that I've shown earlier, this easy connection between frequency and M over Z, uh, M over Z charge ratio. So once we know the frequency, we know the mass. And frequencies is one of the things we can measure most precisely in this world. And as we have most precisely measured frequencies, we have a most precise mass here. So there we are with a very precise mass spectrometer. Uh, the principle is known already from the former Fourier transform mass spectrometers, which were very bulky. You needed liquid nitrogen, liquid helium, liquid helium uh, to maintain. Um, and so you're rid of that with a very compact mass spectrometer with all the favorites of the most precise mass spectrometer you can buy. It is more than that. So it um, contains also um, <clears throat> high precision manufacturing of the devices, um, of the electronics around to control the ions. Um, that's far from being trivial. And we need a device called C-Trap, which later on in the system is a very important device because here the ions are handled before they go into the orbit trap. Um, where they are just scanned out. So we have a very precise uh, mass spectrometer here, but what do you need this precision for? Um, in the development of the mass spectrometer, now we are at the second generation uh, of these devices. So we have a very compact uh, orbit trap here, uh, which is twice as fast in, in um, data acquisition 
uh, as the as the former models were, and this high field next generation orbit trap you will find in all Explorers mass spectrometers. Now we have a very precise instrument with very high resolution. And if you look at a little problem that we've put up here, so we have two different compounds. These are two pesticides in this case, but it could be just any uh, analyte you want to, to look at and any other signal beside it, matrix, background, whatever it might be. So we have two closed masses and um, <clears throat> with a mass spectrometer that is quite precise already in mass, but that doesn't have resolution, you have the problem that uh, on not sufficient resolution, and we are talking about 30,000 resolution here already, this is high resolution already, and still we cannot separate these two peaks properly enough. So you very precisely measure a wrong mass. And only if the resolution gets high enough that you can separate these two peaks, you really can unambiguously identify the compound you want to look at and separate it from the matrix, what's needed uh, for a high sensitive, unambiguous detection of compounds of choice. And so if you look at that here, so the upper line is 30,000 resolution, which is quite high already, uh, and it's not sufficient. If you go to 60,000 resolution, uh, then we see a separation of the peaks, uh, but that's not yet suitable for routine um, because slight changes happen and you are back to the old problem. But if you go to 120,000 resolution, this is the first time where these are baseline separated. This is safe and uh, suitable for routine analysis uh, because they will be always separated and you always can rely on your component of choice being detected unambiguously. Um, just as an information here, of course, you can go higher with the Orbit Jack Explorers 240, for example, and then it comes even more and you could even um, think about separating compounds that are closer together. But with the Orbit Trap 120, with the 120,000 resolution, we are at a place where we're really safe on detecting components unambiguously. <clears throat> and as I said already, an accurate quantitation is only possible with clearly resolved peaks because otherwise you're sitting on the wrong mass, you have a mixture of two peaks combining into one, and so the mass is not correct and the peak intensity is not correct. You cannot quantitate without the proper resolution. Precision and accuracy only gets complete with high resolution. But there's another aspect to that. It's not only to detect one component unambiguously, but we are on full scan. We see the isotope signals and we can make use of it. And with the high resolution that we have on this instrument, up to 120,000, uh, you not only see the different isotopes and you can separate from matrix, but you already see the fine structure of the isotopes because one isotope signal is not only C13, as you may believe, uh, but it's C13, it's O18, it's sulfur 34. And with that, you add additional information in order uh, to have a, a good uh, creation of uh, an elemental composition, determination of elemental composition. And it doesn't only stop here. For example, with sulfur, it's very, very easy to see. If this signal is here, the, the compound needs to contain sulfur, so that's already necessary for, uh, for the determination of the elemental composition. But for the first isotope peak, the same way works, for example, with C13 and N15. So you see the N15 signal down here. And so you can even say this component doesn't contain nitrogen or it contains a bit nitrogen or lots of nitrogen. And so this all goes into the software that we have for determination of elemental composition. And so that makes it even more safe as another point of identification, not only the accurate mass, but we have a very nice elemental composition with fine structure that you easily get uh, with the Orbit Trap Explorers 120 without paying any extra, with doing, without needing to do anything extra in the anal analysis, you just get it for free. And so we make use of it with intelligent software that comes with that instrument to have a good quantitation and an unambiguous identification of compounds with this instrument. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Olaf, uh, for your insight into the or resolution section. This was very uh, interesting, insightful, and, and helpful. So great job. Thanks again. Uh, I also like to thank the audience uh, joining us today, and uh, I encourage you to, uh, to learn more about the latest capabilities of the Orbitrap Explorers 120 mass spectrometer by visiting our website at thermal fisher.com slash orbitrap explorers 120 and of course uh, we welcome you to our next next uh, series of ask the experts thank you and goodbye